Hi, everybody. So as I said before, my name is Sarah Vogel. Um, I work right now at an organization called Global Kids. Um, but before doing that, I worked, that's, that's me at 22 with my very first bilingual class, um, the top picture. They were sixth graders, and I had no idea what I was doing. I was teaching Spanish uh, literacy, so I was teaching this group of students in Spanish um, and learned a ton from that first, from that first year. And um, working within bilingual contexts for a while in New York and abroad, I then transitioned more into um, a technology focus in under-resourced schools all over New York City with Global Kids. And we use Scratch, GameStar Mechanic, and other tools to facilitate students in creating their own games and digital media projects about issues they care about and issues that are um, global in scope. So, I've in some ways experienced bilingual education and technology education in, in these silos. Um, but now, because of the populations of students that we see in our classrooms, those two things I don't think can exist in silos anymore. I think that technology and bilingual education have to start bleeding into each other. And so I'm really at the beginning of this exploration. So I'm going to try to facilitate a conversation between all of us. It sounds like people in here have worked with bilingual students before. Can we just show, show of hands, how many of you have students in your classes that are learning English in school and speak another home language? OK, great. So that's most of us. And I think that that's going to continue to grow um, as our, you know, the population of our country changes in our city. And um, more and more technology is also being used in these classrooms. So um, to, to start us off, I thought we could sort of do a little bit of thinking. Well, these are the things we'll, we'll talk about, a little bit about politics and ways to think about bilingualism to frame our conversation. And then how do, how do we think about Scratch? And then I have some tips at the end of things I've done um, that may be useful to you. So to just start out, um, when you think of this population of students, so students who are learning English at school and speak a different language at home or multiple languages at home, what are some of the terms that we use to label these students or describe them? that you have encountered? ELL for English language learner. OK, ELL, English language learner. Any others that you guys have encountered or heard about? Is that the one that you hear most often in your schools? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So L's for sure. That's the one we hear a lot. But there are a lot of these. So LEP, limited English proficient. How many of you have heard of that now that I say it? Yeah. You get culturally and linguistically diverse students, English as a second language students, English with English language communication barriers, language minority, bilingual students, emergent bilingual. So let's just talk for a second. What are some of the assumptions about students and bilingualism that might be embedded in these terms? Yeah. Well, the, the English as a second language assumes they only know their language of English as opposed to 17. Absolutely. Absolutely. We don't know if English is their second or third or fourth. What else might be some assumptions? Well, language minority one seems really bizarre, probably for certain schools where they might not really be, like, like everyone speaking Spanish might be more common than, than the alternative. Absolutely. Our, our schools are, in a lot of cases, segregated. And we have to realize that. Uh -huh. Also, limited English proficient. Um, just because they don't speak academic English doesn't mean they can't talk with people. Absolutely. That one has a little bit of a a stigma kind of embedded in there, that they're in some way limited, that students are in some way limited. It also implies that like other students aren't learning English. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Does anybody know which um, No Child Left Behind, which term that they use? Can you guys take a guess? Culturally, linguistically diverse. <laughs> nope. No. ESL. Nope. Emergent by Nope. Oh, they use limited English proficient. <sighs> The first one. Um, That's net NCLB. Do you guys know which one is used by New York City DOE? And Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, but do you guys know which one is most often used? I hear L's all the time. Yeah, yeah L's is yeah, used. Yeah. Um, but LEP is sort of the official one because that's the federal thing. But the New York City Department of Ed more and more uses English language learners um, or uses English language learners, but is starting to actually transition to my favorite one. Which one do you think is my favorite one? Yeah. Um, right, that too. That too. I think human beings is the central one. But when we talk about this population, they do face specific challenges. 
that we have to recognize and we don't want to just label them based on that one thing but when we refer to this population in the context of of their um, strengths and their challenges being bilingual students I like using emergent bilinguals because I think it highlights the fact that and also I think emergent multilingual would also be an even stronger term um, for this so a lot of the the this this uh, term we actually see that bilingual is is disappearing from the politics uh, so since NCLB so the um, title 7 of the uh, elementary and Secondary Act, which is the Bilingual Education Act way back when, during NCLB, became language instruction for limited English proficient and immigrant students. So bilingual was just siphoned out when the reauthorization in the law happened. So Garcia, um, Ophelia Garcia, who's the researcher behind a lot of this, has noticed this sort of silencing of bilingual, the B, and she calls it like the B word, because we don't say it anymore. Office of Bilingual Education and Minority Affairs became Office of English Language Acquisition, English Enhancement, and Academic Achievement. So what is this saying about how our system values or doesn't value second, third, fourth home languages? When we see these, do we, do we have that kind of value embedded in our system with the terms we're using? Yeah, I would say no with the disappearance of this the B word, the bilingual word. Um, so yes, the official policies are siphoning these out, but teachers also make language policy in their classrooms. So uh, just to read this quote, for many of us, language policy seems to be something that other people do. But actually, language policies and language politics are part of what each of us use every day. When we allow or disallow the use of one language or another in our classrooms, when we choose which language to use in Congress, conversations, conferences, and curricula, we are making language policy. So teachers, I believe and think, can have a lot of power in terms of what actually happens in the classroom with these language policies. So even if the B word doesn't exist on the federal level, um, the national level, we can use it in our classrooms and we can feel comfortable doing that. Um, so. Yeah, think, think about your own school. Um, how often, or your own learning teaching environment, how often do you hear other languages in your school? Do you know what the language policy is at your school? Or, yeah, or you maybe, every school actually has to have one, um, but they don't often share it with their teachers. But you, you have to write a document every year that says, you know, this is our language policy if you have um, emergent bilinguals or ELLs in your classes. So, like, what? For example, in the policy would be. They might say, they might say if it's a dual language school like yours back there in their language policy, they would say, our school is a dual language school. We allow the use of this language and this language. Or if you have English language learners, emergent bilinguals in your classroom, they might say, we actually have an ESL model. So our our goal is to get students learning in English. Or we have a. Um, transitional bilingual model where we start where it's 60-40 in two languages and then we try to transition them to English. So your school will have that maybe. Yeah, like we, I mean, we're dual language but we also we're you know, many people speak Russian as well. So we teach Hebrew as a second language but then we have ELLs who get pulled out to help with English too. So it's many different Right. A, a lot of our schools, even if they're dual language, like you're saying, have students who are, um, who's might speak many different home languages. Um, and so think about your schools, now that we maybe fleshed it out a little bit, uh, what messages are families and students receiving by the language policy at your school? Is their home language being valued at your school? Do you feel like it is in any way? Yeah. I mean, I, it is in some of, like, where we reach out and like class, well, I I know Spanish and like I can read the subway mornings in right. Spanish, but not have a conversation. Um, so I feel like we we do in the sense of when we reach out to parent, like I have to get someone else to help me for parent outreach for for parents who speak primarily Spanish. Um, but at the same time, in point of fact, like they get called less because I have to schedule that time and it's not as convenient and you know all the things that fall out from that. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, with our school, uh, one of the ways that we try to support ELLs is we try to give them, uh, like, 
worksheets in their language, but it, like, like there's a few kids who speak Arabic, but the Google Translate for Arabic doesn't make any sense. In <laughs> um, so we can't really support them as much as we would like. And the same with like subtitles, if we watch a film, like we, the kids who speak English need the subtitles, and so we can't have it also in Spanish or, or Arabic, which I've never seen oh. a subtitle for. Yeah, but it's, it's really interesting to hear that your school's already trying some of this stuff out, and that's a real strength, well, too. Well, individual teachers. Oh, individual teachers. It's not a school way. Got it. Um, and Cindy? Yeah, um, some of my mentees go to a specifically, I wanna, I'm not sure what the official term they use, but basically an ESL school, where majority of the students are English language learners, where most of the teachers actually speak Spanish. So I'll talk to them, and they'll say, like, you know, Mr. Sanchez today basically taught half the class in Spanish, mm -hmm. and that's how they learn, right? Because it's all there's all mixed together. Yeah, uh, where the teachers and the students pretty much, you know, want they, they I think they want the kids to learn in English, but they're all much more comfortable in a second language. Right, and um, so I think we we see that even if let's say the policies at the school are sort of one way, teachers are individually working this. Those newcomer schools really being at the forefront of thinking about ways to translanguage, which we'll talk about in a second. So um, I think one, one thing that um, really frames my thinking about bilingual education is that we, we can see bilinguals themselves as using language in dynamic ways. I think by just switching my thinking from the fact that languages are not systems that people have, but are practices that people use, to just understand and make sense of the world around them and to interact with different communities has helped me think a lot about um, bilingualism. So this ATV picture, um, they often say, so the, the first model of bilingualism was subtractive, right? Kid comes from some other country, is here learning English only in school, and then they lose their home language, and it's gone, and that's called subtractive, but, um, subtractive bilingualism, right? Then you have additive bilingualism, where you have, it's like a bicycle. So the first is like a unicycle, the second is like a bicycle, and you take the language that you have and then you add another language and there's your bicycle. Um, versus dynamic bilingualism is like an ATV. You have all these language resources and they're just puttering along on the road, super bumpy, moving at their own rates to try to make sense of the world around them no matter what language it is. You probably hear your students speaking multiple languages in the hallways, right? Sometimes it's English, sometimes it's Arabic or Spanish or whatever it is to just figure out and negotiate. And that's dy dynamic bilingualism. So if we sort of think, okay, this is the way our students, and I myself as somebody who learned Spanish, this is how I operate, especially in New York. Um, so if we think that way, then we can think that translanguaging can be used in the classroom. So this is the process by which students and teachers engage in just complex discursive practices in order to make sense of and communicate in multilingual classrooms. Um, so there's a couple different examples of this and what does it look like? So one was already said that you put your worksheet sometimes in Arabic. Even if the translation isn't great, it might be providing some support. Or in the newcomer schools where they go back and forth between different languages. And we used to think that that was bad. We used to think like, no, you should only learn in English or only learn in Spanish and the never the two shall meet. And now we're saying, actually, that's the way that bilinguals think, so why don't we go with it? So some examples of translanguaging that teachers have done um, write two related projects in two languages. So write something in the home language that then uses some English words that you learn along the way. So if you're talking about, um, you know, kitchen words. You write a story and then every time you have the word that you know in English for the kitchen word, you put it in the story. Or you pair share in one language. Students speak in their home language and then share out in English. Or you Google translate your handouts and you have them answer in English. Um, or you have them ask questions. Uh, you ask questions in English and then have the students answer in their home language. So there's multiple ways of doing this. Of course, this is all easier when your teacher speaks the language. It's harder when they don't. And so resources like Google Translate, the students in the room themselves, become, you draw on all those things, just like that ATV, right? Whatever's there so that we can get this content so that you, there can be understanding of new skills and practice and engagement. Um, 
Okay, so what does this actually have to do with Scratch? So I, I framed out all that bilingual stuff. So where, where does Scratch actually come in to this, to this question? Because now our students are not only being asked to learn English in school, to negotiate their home language and maybe grow in their home language, but also learn this other language, which is coding and technology and, and you know 21st century skills. So I think that Scratch can be like another kind of, I think Scratch can nurture this ATV scenario. And I think the ATV language use can also then nurture back into Scratch. So Scratch can help language development and language development can then help you learn Scratch. Um, so I see it as this kind of looping, looping thing. Um, so I've tried a couple of things and I'm not saying that any of this, I don't have any scientific backing to say that it works and I don't have data to, to present to you. But these are things that I've tried, that I've seen, and this is also the context of after school and informal lunch clubs and elective periods, not your like common core tested period of the day. So I can't speak to that. But I can tell you some of the ways I've tried these translanguaging skills in terms of Scratch. And then we can talk about more ways that maybe you would want to try, um, because this is really the beginning of my exploration into this. Um, OK, so the first thing that I've tried, of course, multilingual Scratch. Scratch is awesome. Look how many languages it's in. You can use Scratch in any language. So pro that, con, you need your students to have home language literacy. And I think some of our students do. They've gone to strong schools in their home country or have enrichment at home or, in, or go to Saturday school or Sunday school in their home language. Some of them don't. So it's all about also gauging where they're at. Um, but I found that this works really well with students who have that home language literacy, of course. Okay, so the second thing, of course, is, is translating your, your posters and, and handouts. So these are some of my handouts when we were learning about loops and conditionals. I, I translated in, into Spanish. And I got some help because I, I realized to so scratch actually does have translations in the languages for the different terms. So if you know that, like, what is the if-then statement, you can look and scratch and see it. But some words, like, I didn't know the correct word for conditional statement as applied to the computer science context and loop as applied to computer science. And I found um, one of my coworkers handed me a, a glossary, a technical glossary. So I linked that to my presentation if, if you're interested in seeing it. It's a Spanish translations of technical words. And so I'll, I'll show this up there. But like I said, good for students with home language literacy who are going to be able to read what you, what you put in there. Um, but we'll also talk about this. So my, my class, this after school, this one after school where I've had to do a lot of this experimentation is a little crazy. Like you walk in there, I'm speaking one language, I'm speaking another language, um, just kind of trying to support them to learn the content. Because in, in this particular environment, them getting a great experience out of it is, is sort of more important to me than teaching English. Um, but this has proved to be useful in some cases. Um, OK, then I have students plan their work in the language they're most comfortable with. I rarely have them jump to scratch right away. I like to have them think about their ideas and use whatever language resources they have available. So I, the grammar is bad in the, first, in the first poster, so I know it's bad. But you know, it's like you're, you're, you're working with your own linguistic resources too. Google Translate, whatever you have at hand. Um, so this is some planning that some of my students did. And we also use manipulatives to plan. So they can at least talk their ideas out if there's a peer in the class who speaks their same language, if they don't have that home language literacy to be able to write their ideas down into the posters that you make or the worksheets that you make. Um, and then from there, you also have them plan in one language and use Scratch in another. So this Google Doc was created by one of my students, Maria, where you saw I actually asked her the questions in English. She answered in Spanish, which was fine. And um, these are questions she had about her topic, which was immigration. And then she made her Scratch project about immigration, and she did it in English. Um, so it was the support of planning it, and then she was able to write it. And you'll notice her writing is, um, there's spelling issues to correct, there's grammar and all of that. Uh, if I had more time with her, I possibly would have sat and got it, but she was able to do the animation just fine in Scratch, um, doing it in English. 
And then fourth thing is this sort of thing I'm calling bilingual brainstorming. So they were brainstorming topic ideas and questions they had about the topic. So they decided their topic was going to be the current event story from, or the, I mean, it's still going on, the um, kidnapping of, of the young people in Nigeria by Boko Haram. So they decided that was going to be their topic. So I said, okay, what questions do you guys have? So some students would give me questions and, we, and they'd say them in English. And then I'd ask, okay, who can translate that into Spanish for the beginners? Um, and so some students would then translate. So we would go through and you can't really see from this, but like, where are they? And then, a donde están? I would have ideally done this in different colors so that you could see which one was the Spanish and which one was the English, but you're taking notes in both languages. Um, who took, uh, quien la secuestraron? So that was the, uh, the question. And then I asked, okay, you asked it in, in, in Spanish, who can put that into English for us? So we'd have both languages there and all kids could then follow that conversation. Um, and I think the, the, the cons of this is that you're sl it's slower than an average conversation. It takes double the time. So you have to be ready for that. Um, and also you need to build culture around this. In my room from day one, I was speaking multiple languages. They were speaking multiple languages. It was okay. But to just come in and start speaking another language or using another language is a little bit confusing. Like, why are you doing this? So there's some culture building. And then you need to feel okay making mistakes. They're constantly correcting me. You know, actually it's this, it's not that. And it's like, great, great. Just like we'd have in, in Scratch. I think that we're open to all of that because we work in, a, in the tech environment where you're always making mistakes. And so that, that's okay too in language. Uh, and then the last thing is, of course, like pairing and brokering. So this is Alex. He's the one where I told you when I said, OK, who can tell us how to say this in English? Or who can tell us how to say this in Spanish? He's the one that answers a lot, because he has this sort of foundation in both languages. Um, and the, problem, the, 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 the great thing is he can sort of support his peers. Um, but you sort of run the risk of like putting too much pressure on these kids if you, you overuse them. You got to be careful about your excellent language brokers not feeling burned out. And also that stereotyping. I was talking to a friend of mine about this and she said, oh, whenever there was a new Asian student in the in this class, they would just put me next to them like as if I knew, you know, so you really want to be careful in how you make these groupings and, and be sensitive to to that. So these are the things I've done. Um, unscientifically, I, I think I've, I've seen that they increase engagement and it helps run the class and make sure everybody feels included. But I really want to hear sort of more suggestions from everybody. I'm, set, I'm at the beginning of this exploration and hope that more work can be done in it. So to sort of, oh wait, one more thing. That's right. So all of these, the things that I think have made it more and less successful or things that you have to think about are these external variables. Like I said, home language literacy is crucial. Parent uh, background and education level. Whether the home language is like a high status language or, or seen as like a, not a high status language, which we can, um, we can talk about more in the Q&A. Um, attitude and motivation. Are they here because they want to learn English or they want to learn video game design or are they, what, what's their attitude? Um, and then their own cognitive ability. We have a lot of students who are also um, working with learning disabilities or other sorts of challenges that we want to think about. So, and then also all those factors affecting tech skill development, like access to technology. So you've got the double factors. Great. So yeah, any, any thoughts, questions, and comments for the last 10 minutes? I'd be, I want to open up this conversation because like I said, I'm very much at the beginning of this. I'm curious to know how you um, might make use of or be negative about the common phenomena I've noticed in which people move within a sentence in conversation from language one to language two. It seems like a very interesting phenomenon. And even apparently native speakers are starting to mix these things. And not just because there's a word in English that's much more common to everybody to understand if it's a technology word or something. But real flow back and forth. I don't know too much about it, but I definitely heard it very commonly on the street, not in the school situation particularly. Yeah, it happens. And I think that's part of that ATV um, kind of me method, that you use the language resources that are at, on hand. So it depends on your goal. If I was an English literacy teacher, I would use translanguaging both to help my students 
Um, I, I would use it to help them sort of understand content, but also to understand. We, we then try to say, okay, let's push you and, and have you learn more of the target language, or let's push you and, and have you develop in your native language. But I teach video game design. So for me, it's all about just getting the engagement, getting kids excited. And if they're mixing in words, English and Spanish, English and Spanish, I think that that's okay. Um, but I don't know, that's for now, and I'm very much at the beginning of this. Maybe as I become better at this, I'll also be able to push them in the literacy and the, and the language, language skills. Um, what's great is to then be able to teach them the words in their home language to talk about technology. Because I think too often you see English as the like super scientific technical language, and then your home language is the language of your home. Um, but you could also say, well, there are these words in Spanish, and there are people all over the world who use Spanish in technical fields. But yeah, I, I, that happens, and it's, I, I actually love it when that happens because it shows that they're thinking and they're using all the all the words they have in their minds. How many uh, Scratch right now will translate, like not only the environment but the whole, like like everything more or less gets translated? Are there other environments where that's the case? Because most other things, like literally the, lang the language definition per se is English, right? It's like if is if. Right. Um, um, I haven't, okay. but I bet there are out there some other platforms. Tailblazer does not which is the other you know, software I'm most familiar with. Related to that, I'm curious, it, Scratch, it's not only that you can run it in all these different languages, but you can toggle that yes. on the fly. Mm -hmm. Which I found very useful teaching, you know, if I'm working with a kid, let's say, in Russia, you know, my Russian is non existent. But I can look at the program, mm -hmm. switch it to English. So it's that code, block, it's that block. Help the kid, and then, so do, do you do any? A little bit, definitely. We, I, the other day, um, I had a, a student sort of sitting at the computer. She's primarily Spanish dominant speaker. So she, we had her uh, sort of trying to make her character move with the arrow keys. So she had it on Spanish. And then there were some students in the room who were like, it's in Spanish, I don't get it. And so then we were kind of going back and forth so that both she could run it and then they could understand what, what she was doing. But so one point, Sean, is that it doesn't toggle, if you've written text, yeah, right. you know, that is in toggle, which right. is very important. Yeah. Um, any other strategies that anybody has used in here that they find useful? Um, yeah. It might be fun to do using the list uh, feature of um, Scratch to actually make a dictionary that could, you, know, you could translate some words that would look it up, you know, to parallel lists and they fill out the English and the Spanish or whatever the pair of languages and they could sort of make a sort of a fun translation program. Absolutely, and that's where I see the other side of the loop. So Scratch, um, you, can, you can use your language abilities to help you understand Scratch, but then you can use Scratch to help you become more sophisticated at language in that way. Make a project so you're developing those 21st century skills and language skills at the same time. To a bilingual Mad Libs. Yeah, yeah. Create a translation. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? Um, just a comment. It's not completely related to your experience, but it's about this translation. Just because trans trans languages can actually be applied to programming languages as well, because there are programming languages and can be translated from one to the other. Yeah, I don't know as much about that, but I'm sure. And this book that I just I was just reading has that sort of translation between one and the other. It's outside. Yeah, it is outside. There's other. If you wanna, um, I was at Six C for a conference, and there's a number of tools that aid in that specifically. Um, so Pencil Code does like a block block based, but you can literally hit a button and it will fade it into JavaScript or some homebrew language that is text-based um, that allows, so pencil code. Um, and I've done, I gave a talk two times ago about transitioning from scratch to Python, sort of strategies around that. Um, so there are people who are, are thinking about that particular topic and saying like, you know, the concept is important, not the language, and these are all the ways you represent it different. There's this strong parallel with all your experience with programming now. Yeah. 
That's true. The, the SNAP programming language that Beauty Enjoy Computing mm -hmm. uses also has a toggle where you can see your block program in like Python and C++ and other things. SNAP. Cool, cool. Any other questions or ideas? Okay.